Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us here at another live stream at the Academic Innovation Channel at Wolfram Research. We are joined by three very distinguished guests today. We have Victor Galitsky, who is a professor uh, of quantum physics at the Joint Quantum Institute, University of Maryland, also editor for the Annals of Physics and CTO of ScienceCast, which builds AI tools to process research data for archives, publishers, and digital repositories. We're also joined by Richard Sever, Assistant Director of Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory Press, co-founder of the BioArchive and MedArchive services. And we have Stein Sigurdsson, who is the director, Scientific Director of Archive and Professor in the Department of Astronomy and Astrophysics at Penn State University. Uh, we're also joined by uh, Michael Trott here from Wolfram Research, uh, Executive Chief, Sci Chief Scientist for Wolfram Alpha. And today's topic, we're going to be discussing the impact of AI on the future of scientific publishing. Now, this is a, a very broad ranging topic that is likely to have a huge import and impact on the way that research is carried out in the future. So uh, the format, in case this is your first time joining us for a broadcast like this, is that we're going to spend some time where our guests are going to introduce what they've been up to, uh, both in the, you know, introducing the concepts of what are archives, for those of you who may not be familiar, and then we're also going to get into what they've been up to recently with projects like ScienceCast and Archive Labs. And then we'll have also a bit more freeform discussion where we discuss some specific questions within this topic. And if you're here in the audience, as always, feel free to put questions in chat. And uh, after we go through some of the introductory materials, then we'll be more than happy to discuss audience questions that make their way into that chat. So uh, thank you all very much for being here. Uh, it, it is a real pleasure to be speaking with all of you. So why don't we start off with just a quick introduction. What is archive and why is archive uh, something that came to be in the first place? And so we can start with uh, Stein uh, discussing this topic. Thank you. Um, so archive uh, actually predates the web. It was uh, founded in August 1991 uh, over a casual conversation at the Aspen Center of Physics by Paul Ginspark, who is uh, currently a professor at Cornell. Uh, it is a curated research sharing platform. Uh, it is intended for um, PhD level research. Uh, and the basic idea is you, uh, when your paper is ready to be submitted or when you're happy with it, um, you can share it quickly and for free with your uh, with other researchers and for other people to see. Uh, it is uh, set up to be by scientists and for scientists, although obviously uh, anybody can read it. And it's, uh, we also encourage uh, interested people to read about research uh, uh, as, in, as in the, the, it's not restricted to scientists. It's just our driving audience is, is scientific researchers who are interested in finding out about research. And it is free to read and it's free to submit. Uh, we don't charge anything to our authors or our readers. Uh, Archive is uh, hosted at Cornell University and um, has been for the last 20 years. It covers specific subject areas, uh, specifically physics, where it started, uh, mathematics, computer science, statistics, quantitative finance and quantitative biology, economics, and electrical engineering and system science. And we are hoping to expand further uh, as and when we get capacity. Um, next slide, please. So uh, scope of archive, uh, it's worldwide. Uh, in fact, our biggest impact uh, is outside uh, US and Europe now. Uh, we uh, have billions of downloads. Uh, our current hit rate is a few hundred thousand uh, per hour. And uh, we have uh, 5 million uh, roughly monthly uh, active users, distinct active users. Uh, we host uh, 2.4 million research articles in the subject areas we cover. And our current uh, growth rate is about 18,000 papers a month, uh, roughly 1,000 papers per working day. Uh, we are sub uh, supported by uh, member institutions, uh, mostly universities and libraries and research centers. Uh, uh, over 200 of those, and by donations from uh, individuals and foundations, uh, in particular the Simons Foundation. Uh, it is a curated platform. It is not the internet. Uh, it is not just a website where you can upload anything. Uh, content is categorized uh, and uh, moderated, both through automated tools, including some uh, AI tools, and uh, by over 200 volunteer moderators. And the, the typical uh, volunteer moderator is a tenured uh, faculty member in the subject area that they're moderating. Uh, 
that works in the subject area they're moderating. Uh, we currently have 153 categories uh, and we have a governing board, uh, actually three go three governing boards to co uh, covering different aspects of uh, archive and uh, we, are, we have staff. We have uh, uh, 22 part-time and full-time paid staff, uh, most of them are Cornell employees. Uh, next, please. A uh, uh, feature of archive that uh, we started uh, a little bit before COVID, fortunately before COVID, is archive labs. Um, archive labs is basically a space where we um, can experiment with stuff, uh, in particular with outside partners, uh, because we recognize that we don't have the capacity in-house to try out a lot of stuff that is interesting and of potential use to archive users. And so we created a space where people can formally uh, collaborate or partner with us to do stuff. And we currently have 15 um, uh, partners uh, covering things like recommendation engines, uh, linking uh, code to source, uh, summaries of uh, research content, and um, lots of fun tools. Uh, the Archive Labs, by the way, are found at the bottom of the abstract page. Nobody knows they're there. But if you, if you go to the bottom of the page and click around, you'll see stuff. And uh, the idea is to have a framework which allows collaborations and interactions and enriched content, uh, some of which may uh, be brought into be inlined with archive. Uh, particular examples R5, which generated HTML papers, uh, versions of uh, archive content, and which we brought in house and is now uh, part of archive uh, live service, where every paper we make an attempt to uh, convert um, the text source uh, to HTML. Uh, next. Oh, and that hands over to Richard for his time. Uh, uh, thanks. Uh, sorry. Richard, if, if you could, oh, excuse me, sorry. So yeah, Richard, if you could please now also uh, set up for audience. So our archive uh, was the first one on the block, but now BioArchive and MetaArchive are also very important within their respective fields. So uh, please, uh, if you could motivate these for us. Yeah, well, thanks very much. Um, so uh, BioArchive and MedArchive are very much inspired by Archive. Um, and actually, Paul Ginsberg, who Stein mentioned, was on the launch advisory board for BioArchive. And really what we wanted to do with um, BioArchive and MedArchive was bring the culture of um, Archive to biologists and clinicians, uh, res respectively. Um, you know, I often say, you know, the, the inspiration was that two million physicists can't be wrong. Um, uh, but there was a recognition that there was, you know, there are cultural differences and there are some concerns around medical information and biological information. So hence a separate server with slightly different procedures. Um, they're, they're both nonprofit. Um, BioArchive is based at Cold Spring Harbor Lab. So Cold Spring Harbor is analogous, playing in a, a role analogous to Cornell here. And MedArchive is a partnership with BMJ and Yale. Um, they're both nonprofit. Just like archive submission and access are entirely free. Anyone can submit. The, the content is not peer reviewed, um, but it is screened. So uh, much like uh, archive, there are um, essentially uh, uh, senior investigators who who look at papers and and say they they're okay. They're not reviewing them, but they're just that they're saying they're not nonsense. Um, we now have um, a quarter of a million papers across the two servers. We get something like uh, five five thousand papers a month. You know, so a few hundred a day and uh, around 10 million people looking at um, these papers uh, every month. Um, uh, next slide, please. Um, and this was really our motivation for, for setting up BioArchive and MedArchive, which was this recognition that in the traditional publishing process uh, in which um, scientists will submit to a journal and then basically have to surmount the hurdles of the editor, the referees, multiple rounds of revision, and on average, it takes a year, um, that this could significantly um, delay the progress of science. And actually, you know, academics are routinely seeing uh, uh, material at conferences and unpeer reviewed material. So they're perfectly equipped to judge it themselves. So if it can be distributed in a matter of hours or days rather than months or years, that could have a significant uh, impact. So next slide, please. And you can do sort of back of envelope calculations around this as to how much of the um, uh, uh, how much of a problem this delay is. And if you were to eliminate the delay by this rapid sharing of information like archive, bioarchive and MedArchive do, you could have a significant 
um, effect on the progress of science and really speed science up. Um, and Steve Quake at the Biohub in San Francisco did a few back of envelope calculations uh, in which he concluded that with, within 10 years, you really could speed up um, science fivefold. Um, next slide, please. Um, and so, you know, I mean, that's that's a kind of back of envelope calculation, sort of rather hypothetical. But of course, when the pandemic arrived, we, we began to see this in real time, see concrete examples of the benefits of speeding up science in this way. Um, across BioArchive bio and MedArchive, we had 29,000 papers on COVID um, in those four years. And these this started almost immediately. We got our first paper in January uh, 18th of 2020. And we started seeing waves of submissions from China about the um, epidemiology of the spread of COVID, the structure of the spike protein, et cetera, the fundamental biochemistry of how the virus was working. And then, you know, uh, amazingly, the clinical trial showing that dexamethasone, a steroid, was an effective treatment for COVID and the hydroxychloroquine wasn't. Then we saw details of the viral variants, the performance of the vaccines to the extent that most biologists and certainly not the chief medical advisor to the US president hadn't thought of preprints before, but by the time COVID came, you had um, Anthony Fauci advocating for this. You had um, Samuel Swaminathan, the chief scientist of the WHO, um, uh, advocating for it. And, you know, and a med archive author told me recently that, you know, it's very clear there are people who are alive today because of this rapid sharing of information who wouldn't have been. And that is thanks to this preprint, to this early sharing of information. Uh, next slide, please. So, I mean, as the, the, our philosophy has been about decoupling the dissemination of information from its subsequent evaluation and certification to, to kind of speed up the scientific process. But much like um, uh, archive labs, we have an analogous thing called the bioarchive dashboard where we feel that this decoupling allows experiments in peer review, experiments in evaluation, experiments in community building. So if you go to a bioarchive paper, you can launch this dashboard, which has third party services. In this case, what I'm displaying here is a peer review from a journal that is entirely separate from bioarchive, but it's peer reviewing this content on bioarchive. Um, and there is communities here, as I said, and uh, social media mentions, etc., and automated tools, one of which is um, ScienceCast, and you'll hear a bit more from uh, Victor about that later. That's me, over. Thanks so much, Richard. That, that really, uh, you know, having a very concrete example of where advancing scientific process benefits people uh, is kind of unique, I think, uh, in some ways uh, with recent experiences that everyone has had. So, uh, all right, so Victor, uh, I know that there's been a lot of great work going on uh, in, in terms of how AI tools can help with a lot of these dissemination of information and how the scientific publishing process should happen. So if you could please give us a, a, a quick brief overview into the sorts of things that have been ongoing in that domain before we get into the more freeform discussion. Uh, of course. Uh, yes, thank you, uh, John, first of all, for uh, organizing this event and for inviting us to uh, participate. So yeah, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about ScienceCast, which you can view as a sort of AI substrate for various archives and open size repositories in general. So um, we have Moshe Levy here on the call, who is doing most of our um original AI work and a wonderful group of people working with us. Uh, you can see them here. So I will start kind of with a brief history. So we're discussing scientific publishing. So what is scientific publishing? So it's an ancient industry. So you can go way back to the 15th century when the printing press was invented uh, by Gutenberg. And um, the first journal uh, was founded back in the 17th century. And actually this journal Philosophical Transactions of Royal Society still exists up to this day. So the first peer review appeared in 1731, and around the beginning of the 20th century, an external peer review system was introduced kind of en masse. Um, the publishing system as we use it today, uh, in particular the for-profit publishing industry, was invented, quote unquote, around 1948 by Robert Maxwell, who was a rather, rather controversial figure. And uh, I would argue that, well, one of the best things, scientific publishing 
that happened recently was what Stein mentioned, uh, namely the invention of archive, which is open access repository in 91 by Paul Ginsburg, who launched it in Los Alamos. And arguably, uh, we are now going through another disruption, uh, which is driven by AI. And this is sort of the topic of today's discussion. So, but all in all, we're still using the kind of ancient publishing model. Now, I would like to start with the emphasizing sort of pain points of the um, traditional scientific publishing, which AI may resolve or on the other hand, uh, make them worse. And we, it's, it remains to be seen what will happen. So in my opinion, a key problem facing uh, science in general and scientific publishing in particular is actually overflow, exponential overflow of data. So for example, here, what I'm showing is how many papers were published in quantum physics by Einstein, Feynman, Schwinger, Dirac in the first 50 years of the 20th century. It's about uh, 1,600. In this century, we have about a million papers published in quantum physics, not by Einstein, Dirac, and Feynman. And it would take a human being about 200 years to read them if you don't do anything else. If you just read, you're not allowed to think, check references, or eat, it will take you about 200 years. Now, another example from Richard's territory, so COVID. So obviously, it's only, we're talking, it's COVID-19, so it's by definition four or five years. So we already have four, about half million papers, almost exactly, I checked yesterday, which will take a human about 100 years to read. So here's a problem for you right there, so that we need some new uh, tools to process information. And the word exponential here is not just a figure of speech. So here what's plotted is actually submission rate, monthly submission rate to archive.org, which arguably is actually exponential. So here is actually COVID plateau because there was no experiment. And this, I'm afraid, are LLM generated papers contributing to further increase. So, but all in all, we're kind of no longer capable of keeping up with the latest research, even in highly specialized fields. And the reason we started this project originally, even unrelated to AI, was try to resolve a little bit this issue. Now, kind of a big question you can ask. So if, if Einstein were to write his miracle year papers now in 2024, would we even notice them in this fire hose of publications and data? So I think one of the key, key issues uh, facing science is how to extract gems from pile of uh, fire hose of data. Now, let me just say a few words about the current publishing system, and then I will actually move to AI. So, um, so the current publishing system is a big industry. It's an old industry, and the mid business model of this industry is the following. So, we write papers for free. We refer you papers for free. We oftentimes work as editors for free or small pay, and then we pay to read our own papers without, without noticing. So this is actually a budget of a typical university, a $33 million total budget, about 12 million goes to subscriptions. So it's about 10 million per university per year and $25 billion in revenues for science publishers. Actually it's profit margin more than Google and Coca-Cola. So this is the type of um, industry we're dealing with and it has its uh, you know positive and negative sides. And I'll talk about that. But sort of this is what we're dealing with. Now, why are we publishing in, in journals? Why do we actually do it? So there are a lot of pressures to publish, uh, well, um, related to funding, promotion and tenure, et cetera, but also at some high level. So the value that journals actually provide, they're an attention focusing basically vehicle. So if you get a paper published in a high impact journal versus the same paper published elsewhere, so the former will have a much higher impact. And um, so journals obviously select papers based on peer review, but many people, myself included, believe that the traditional peer review system is broken, primarily because of the information overload, because people just don't have time to review, especially for free. So, and this leads to many uh, problems, and some of them I will mention later. Now, how does AI enter this picture of science and scientific publishing in general? So, um, and so here uh, in this column, I will mention briefly and then elaborate on that some possibilities provided by artificial intelligence and particular 
these things we actually um, have implemented with archive, bioarchive, and within this science guest project. So an obvious one where LLMs are actually good uh, is summarization. So kind of elevator pitch. So get to the point, essentially. So if people don't have time to read and process all this data, so AI is pretty good at uh, kind of summarizing things. Um, and uh, that's one um, uh, thing where we can um, use AI. Another I'll show you is sort of discovery, for example, conversa conversational search, uh, sort of uh, spe specialized uh, search engine. So another thing, which is actually a very big issue, in fact, uh, I know Archive has a special sort of task force to uh, contribute to it, so it's accessibility. Uh, because open access doesn't uh, automatically imply accessibility. So there are people with disabilities, there are people who have language barriers, and uh, AI can certainly help uh, to with accessibility. For example, what we do is where we transform uh, the summaries into audio format, and there's also translation, which is pretty easy to do with AI. So this is another good thing. So with due to this kind of uh, avalanche of data, so uh, big problem, and Stein can correct me if I'm wrong, so but I think it is indeed a big problem. I'm a moderator at Archive, so there is a kind of shortage of manpower for uh, moderating it, moderating such a huge uh, volume of submissions, and we need a reasonable automated initial, not final, but initial screening of the content. So I'll talk to you a little bit maybe about smart referee selection and some AI research assistant, but also I'll mention that on the problem side where AI can Exist, uh, basically make these problems worse is that if people use large language models to write poor quality papers, and unfortunately that's happening. In fact, as a journal editor, not only I see LLM written papers, I also see LLM written reviews and responses to these reviews, kind of closing the loop, which is obviously ridiculous. So that's something we don't want. So obviously misinformation, and I'll show you pretty um, uh, striking uh, examples of that. Um, so misinformation by hallucinations of AI. So I mentioned already AI generated quote unquote peer reviews. And well, a big issue on which I don't have an opinion, it's a copyright issue when training. So um, yeah, now just give you a few examples of things we actually have been doing with, for example, this is uh, an example of um, a feature which we introduced uh, in embedded into BioArchive. Uh, well, as it turns out, most people accessing uh, archive and bioarchive content actually not necessarily professional scientists. So uh, Stein mentioned that they have about 300,000 visitors per hour to archive, which means it's millions every day. So there are not that many scientists in the world. So most people who read these papers actually are not familiar with the jargon and terminology. And there's some value in having sort of summaries, which are tunable summaries with tunable level of expertise. And you, we can do it. And we have embedded it in Archive, bioarchive, uh, which provides the summaries uh, kind of uh, tailored to a specific audience and you can change it. So another thing, and this is done in collaboration with 11 Labs, which is a, a text-to-speech company. Um, um, and also that's how we started with Stein and Archive is that um, we um, uh, uh, provide audio uh, summaries for papers. So if you, um, let me just show you. So if you go down, uh, here, so you will see. Quantum entanglement is a fundamental aspect of quantum mechanics. Yeah, so basically what, what happens here is that AI uh, through API, uh, well, we, we get the paper, we process it into summaries, uh, in this case, at the uh, non-expert level of ex uh, sort of, um, of a reader, and then uh, uh, transform it via text-to-speech into an audio abstract, which uh, helps accessibility. Um, so another thing, I mentioned is conversational search engine where you can just um, um, basically ask a question. The primary entry point into ScienceCast's suite of tools is the conversational search engine inspired by Perplexity AI. The sources used by the conversational AI are shown here placed along the x-axis in order of publication date and along the y-axis according to their semantic relevance. Each source can be used as a starting point for another search that shows similar papers. Once you find a paper you'd like to explore, you can go to the corresponding cast, which is an audio summary of the paper. The paper proposes a new neural network architecture. So basically here, what happened is that we take papers and we embed them, which means we uh, create essentially a vector in some multidimensional space, which is like a fingerprint, as Richard put it, 
uh, of a paper. And uh, this vector embedding allows us to search for similarity between papers and or queries uh, that people provide. And this is a useful search engine. So uh, just I will mention, so sort of another example, which I personally love because I don't like preparing talks uh, is, um, you know, you can just type in archive ID and generate, for example, a PowerPoint presentation on the fly. Uh, and I love it because I hate preparing PowerPoint presentations. So, uh, and uh, it can save many hours um, of work. So, uh, just kind of wrapping up. So another other things we're working on is uh, screening for contradiction and similarity between papers. I mentioned that one can embed papers into vectors in some multidimensional space and then look at uh, similarity if vectors are kind of almost aligned or in some subspace if they're uh, uh, at 180 degrees, which means they contradict each other. This is kind of red flagging. So predicting potential impact of papers through new metrics unrelated to, to citations, because citations often lag and they're oftentimes ceremonial citations. It has actually interesting also applications to other spaces uh, like government. US government is very interested in potential impacts, impact of various events, not necessarily papers. And uh, some algorithm that we developed may be of interest to that too. So flagging low quality content and fraudulent data, tracing ideas uh, and facts to the original sources, and uh, potentially help in peer review, but not, not peer review, but for example, recommendation engine is actually kind of dual to the problem of referee selection. So on the negative side of things, um, so PI is creating, and that's not what we do, but they're just happening like, organically. So there are papers in this case, they're actually peer reviewed papers which appeared in the journal. So, uh, and you can see here that it went through peer review with flying colors and it says, please note as an AI language model, I'm unable to generate tables. And perhaps the most well-known is also another paper, which I think is one of the most downloaded recent papers in the Richard's territory is this paper, which uh, where the image was generated using uh, artificial intelligence. And I would, you know, if Richard wants to comment on that, please do, I'm not an expert on this particular issue. But uh, both these papers were retracted, but this is just the beginning of this negative, I guess, um, trend where there are papers being generated by LLMs with very low quality. I think I am out of time, and so I'll just kill my screen share, and uh, I'm done. So thank you. Thanks all so much for that that sort of introduction to some of the uh, both motivations and some of the recent work that's been going on. So there's a lot to unpack here. Uh, we also uh, have a couple of audience questions already. So uh, building off of one of the audience questions that we have, uh, let's back up a little bit from the topic of AI and just talk about uh, how one thinks about preprints in the context of disseminating scientific knowledge. So the, the audience question is that, you know, the, the term academic paper and, and therefore the form in which we disseminate knowledge carries a lot of baggage from when the printing press was the best that we could do, right? And so the, the question is, uh, how does one think about the fact that now we have the internet and electronic means of disseminating this, and how does that bear on the relationship between the value of preprints and the value of you know peer-reviewed published publications? I, I wonder if we could uh, briefly just touch on that topic. So let, let's maybe uh, go in sort of the same order that we uh, had, had gone in before. So we'll start with Stein. Um, so how, how does one think about the relationship between preprints to peer-reviewed things, uh, given that you know in the past all one could do is have a printing press, but now we have these these new means of disseminating information. So obviously, this is something we've considered quite heavily. Um, my 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 take on this is that um, when you're when you're ready to share your research, uh, you, you need to accept the fact that you may have made errors. Uh, there's no, it's no, it's not a sin to be wrong, and the whole point is to get feedback on your research and and get correction and uh, in, input for improvement. Um, in practice, the majority of uh, preprints uh, have very, relatively small changes between uh, coming out an archive in particular and being published. Uh, we have, that's actually been studied several times and you get consistent results. Although, as I noticed, the, the introduction of the word not 
it is a very small change to a paper, but but makes a very big difference to the conclusion of the paper in in principle. Mm -hmm. So 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 the size of the changes is not necessarily indicative of the uh, impact of the changes. Uh, this depends a little bit on what research area you're in. Uh, there are different norms in 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 different uh, fields about what is important. Uh, mathematicians, for example, are are very concerned about proofs and formal. Uh, formally show that things are correct in some strict sense. Uh, others are more, we want to get the data out there. In astronomy, for example, there's high value in unique one-time data being shared because it can be used uh, over time and in conjunction with other data. Um, the, the other way I think about it is um, it, it's not just a matter of correctness. It's also a matter of whether things are interesting. And that's really where you want to get the speed of things going, where you want to get the conversation going quickly and shake out what's interesting and what isn't. Um, there's stuff that's incorrect but interesting in the sense that it highlights issues that should enter the scientific conversation. And, and there's stuff that's absolutely correct and of very little interest. Uh, and, and sadly, that is, that is a fair, not, fair amount of research because you don't know often what's going to be interesting until you try it. And, and famously, there's a need to, to pr produce neg uh, negative results. I tried this. It didn't work. Everybody, don't bother trying this. Yes, that, those are all excellent points. Yep. Uh, so w one of the things that you brought up is this, this difference in norms between various fields. So uh, perhaps, uh, Richard, you'd be in a great position to comment on. Uh, so in, in the context you already alluded to in medical research, uh, you know, perhaps there are some different processes that are necessary for thinking about the relationship between preprint and publication in, in those fields. So could you elaborate on that a little bit for us, please? Sure. I mean, I would I would certainly echo what, what Stein said and, and, and sort of before I say anything, underscore the importance of the ability to revise in response to feedback and the importance of kind of peer criticism and that whole kind of like sort of dialogue that goes on. But I think one thing that's really important in the context of that original question to understand is the history of scientific communication in papers. Um, a lot of the time there's this sort of somewhat false narrative that, you know, 300 years ago, journals were created much as they are today and that everybody's been doing this for 300 years and it, it's never changed. The, the reality is, that, is actually that um, peer review as we currently perform it is only about 40 years old. So, you know, the Lancet, the Premier Medical Journal and um, Nature, Science, all those um, journals only started doing what we now call peer review after World War II. Actually, what happened prior to that was that papers were refereed when they came to journals. And what they that was mainly by societies wanting to make sure they weren't putting stuff out that was really crazy and an embarrassment to the society. So uh, funnily enough, that actually looks like the kind of screening that BioArchive and, and Ar MedArchive perform. Um, but then what happened was, you know, because of the explosion of research after World War II, there was a real drive for, you know, papers needed filtering. There was concern about the, um, the, this concept of peer review because, you know, the, the politicians might co-opt messages, so peers had to evaluate them. And you've got the conflation of a whole bunch of different things. So it's really important to say, you know, the, the, the thing where, the, the, you know, in, in Victor's timeline, the thing we're, we're changing is not this thing that's been happening for 350 years. It's this thing that's been happening for 40 years and has become, a, you know, I think one of the dangers is a distortion to the academic process because we end up having this conflation where we equate the importance of the work, the quality of the work and the impact of the work. And, you know, and, and the worry is that people actually say, oh, you know, there's a phrase we use in biology quite a lot, which is the journal that you publish in is more important than what you publish. And it sounds facetious, but actually for people's careers, that's probably true. Okay. So I think that you have to set against that background. And then, there, then there's the, the other issue, which is when you get kind of clinically actionable information and you have worries about misinformation. So one of the things we're very keen on at, at MedArchive is we have, a, we have a kind of category of paper, which we say is better after peer review. There's some things that, that could immediately change public behavior that you really want to be a bit more sure of. And so, you know, there's something, so I'm, I'm all for rapid dissemination, but there's a class of paper that shouldn't be rapidly disseminated 
but I always point out that's probably like 0.01% of work. And we need to have a conversation about educating the public about the nature of scientific evidence, at what point something becomes actionable. You know, the FDA don't approve a drug just because it's been, appeared in, a, in the New England Journal of Medicine. So that's a more complicated process. So that was a bit of a long-winded <laughs> answer to your question. No, thank you. Uh, so, Victor, I saw that, that you wanted to interject about one of these points. And then also as a follow up, um, you, you also brought up this this uh, couple of different things that get conflated in the way that things are done currently in scientific publication, where there's this question of first, is it nonsense? And then is it interesting? So uh, what what did you want to add to, to uh, Richard's comments? And then also if we could comment on on how, how do you think about de-conflating these, these various things? Yeah, so... Um... I do want to comment a little bit on the current state of peer review, but more as an author and referee and also an editor uh, who deals with this. So um, I recently asked my colleagues, and my expertise is quantum physics, have you ever received a useful review? Ever. So I've, I've never received actually a useful peer review. So, and most people said, not really. So it's more like, an, at least in our field, it's more like uh, exercise to get things published than to seek the truth. And I think, I don't know why it's the case, but I think the reason for this, I mean, I think it may be different in biology. It certainly is different in mathematics. It, it is very much field specific, but I think the real reason for that is because, uh, well, let's say we spent a year writing a paper, we submitted it to a journal um, and then uh, editor sends it to referees. Referees don't have time. They don't have a year to check our results. So they have five minutes, they look at it superficially, they, ha they may have their own biases. And I'm, a, I'm also in these shoes. So people don't have time to do work for free, which is actually difficult work, which is due diligence basically on very complicated research. So I think one big question to answer in general is whether the current peer review system is working at all. So, and it, I think it's very much field specific. And mathematics, which is a smaller community where there are well-defined problems that mathematicians consider important. Uh, I think they actually do a pretty good job in verifying their proof. So I have a question to mathematicians though, how do they select which problems are important? And nobody can answer. They say, oh, Hilbert told us 200 years ago. <laughs> 100 years ago. But if you start asking why, nobody can actually answer. So it's a bit of a club. So in this situation, I think peer review works. But if you have a fast developing field, very large field with a lot of competing industry interests, etc. So peer review needs to be rethought, in my opinion. So and I also certainly agree with Stein that interesting and um, um, correct are um, not necessarily um, the same thing. And high impact. so there have been a lot of high impact back papers which were originally wrong. Like for example, the first paper by Abrikos upon vortices was wrong. It predicted, he got Nobel prize for this. He predicted a square lattice, it was supposed to be triangle lattice. So there was a paper, there were many examples of papers that got eventually basically Nobel prize that were actually wrong at some level. But there are also a lot of papers which are uninteresting and wrong. So those we don't want <laughs> for sure. So, uh, yeah, but uh, I don't have a solution actually uh, to this very difficult question, but I think it's important to recognize that this problem exists. Um, yeah. all, all excellent points and we have some more audience questions. Before getting to some of these audience questions, uh, I wanted to also ask uh, Michael, so you, you spend a lot of time uh, you know, learning what there is in the very rapidly evolving field of large language models and how those are relevant for building AI tools. and uh, you know, part of the, the dissemination of information through preprint seems to me to be critical to this process. So I was hoping you could comment on that, that quick, quickly moving uh, aspect of why it's important to have a dissemination mechanism that can move at the speed at which people are actually having the ideas and, and communicating about them. I think the mentioned five-fold speed up is probably an underestimate if we think on LLMs. What happened over the last, uh, no, I would say, for most people it became visible maybe in November 22 with mm -hmm. some of the Galactica papers or Minerva, uh, some people outside of the direct CS field uh, noticed this. And then what happened the last 14, 15 months is pretty amazing. And 
I find it nearly daunting by now uh, to look on Monday evening what has been published in the archive CS. But I think last Monday it was 910 papers. Uh, so just reading the title and have a look at the abstract, what's of interesting takes me one and a half hours to go through. Uh, on the other side, uh, it really is the only way I can see that one uh, disseminates the knowledge quick enough and uh, sees what people do. And the breadth of what uh, what is done in the especially LLM world, on the one side, on the actual implementation of LLMs and techniques, but also on the application side and the, uh, the whole prompting technique, something that... Uh, I think kind of more most people would have never thought would become important that you spend a fair amount of your time thinking how do I ask a machine something like uh, an old science fiction book would have probably always thought kind of you just ask the machine and the machine will answer it, but now it's so that nearly every day there is at least one, not every single one is sensible, but one uh, useful paper about prompting techniques. Like there was this one on Monday that really uh, on GDP4 proved that with a little bit more than 1% uh, with sufficient statistics, you get a better result if you have enough uh, new line characters in your prompt so that your prompt is sufficiently structured. And I think it's very important that all these little things uh, get distributed quickly in the world so that we can stand on the shoulder of giants and quickly within timescale couple months uh, come to really new levels of uh, of research and usage of the things. Richard, it looks like you want to make a comment on this topic as well. Yeah, I mean, I just thought I'd given an, an example from biology of where that kind of th where things are moving too fast for the current system. And one, you know, many years ago, when we had the first SARS um, outbreak, somebody pointed out that 99% of the papers about the SARS virus were published after the epidemic had ended. And of course, this was actually a very, and this was a call for, you know, something like archive in, in, in biology. And of course, come COVID, we had exactly this experience. And there was, there was examples where, you know, people pointed out that if you were writing a paper on the beta variant of the SARS-CoV-2 variant, of the SARS-CoV-2 virus, by the time that was published, the beta variant no longer existed and everybody was infected with Delta. Right. So if you can disseminate your material within 48 hours, then you actually have a time to be talking about something at, you know, uh, uh, you know, on time concurrently. Mm -hmm. So there are two audience questions which are very related to, to points that uh, all of you have have uh, alluded to and, and Victor sort of explicitly stated. Uh, so one question uh, is more of a comment, actually, that's. Uh, you know, one of the great things is that you know anyone can look at these uh, preprints and get direct access to the the most recent things, right? So you, you you'd uh, or perhaps actually it was Stein uh, who who had mentioned that the uh, the volume of people who are looking at at these services uh, are greater than the number of scientists that are out there, and so you know just curious people who are out there uh, are able to actually gain benefit from this. Um, and then a, a related point is you know, answering this what, what's interesting question. Uh, so we have a question about uh, looking at citation networks and what, what might be some ways that as we start to segue a little bit into talking more about AI tools and how this is perhaps going to shape things in the future. Uh, what You mentioned new metrics. Uh, so let, let's start with Victor. What, what sorts of things uh, might there be out there that are either being actively looked into or are sort of in, in the early phases of thinking about what would be other ways of trying to solve this, this problem that you posed of, let's say that, you know, the equivalent of the Einstein miracle papers were, were written amongst the sea of other things. How do we make sure that those are discovered uh, in a way that makes them useful to people? Yeah. So I think actually there, there is a very high probability that there are in fact Einstein papers being written that people have missed. We just don't know about it. So uh, I find uh, that plausible, yeah. So how to um, solve it is a billion dollar question. So, but I think some simple um, ideas that uh, I'd like to comment on. So first of all, 
let's look at archive. So I think Michael uh, Trot just mentioned that there were, I think, 910 papers, if I'm not mistaken, in LLM just in one day. So it takes, you know, Michael, hour and a half to read just the titles. So obviously it's a very time consuming exercise. So there is, uh, it's similar for all fields, right? So, and at the moment, archive papers are just time ordered. So there is a cutoff for submission and it's time ordered. And there is this pretty um, curious, uh, um, in, you know, kind of data. And I think Stein will correct me, please correct me if I'm wrong, that paper that appears first is cited 10 times as much than paper that appears at a number 55, independently of the content. I don't know, Stein, can you comment on the actual numbers? Uh, the, the ordering effect is is well known and studied. Um, the It's not as simple as you think, because there's also a factor where um, people who are motivated in certain ways work at this, they, they game it, and, and that correlates with in principle with the impact of the result. There's basically people who are fired up and think they have a high impact result or from a, or from a large, well-structured research group organized to, to take advantage of this. And, and that co-correlates with the impact of the research anyway. So, so, so it's not a trivial problem to de facto. We, we are aware of it and all the solutions we thought of are worse than the problem. Yeah, so, but arguably, okay. time ordering of papers is not necessarily the best um, indicator of, you know, disruption. So, and an obvious, um, I think, a solution that AI could help with is at least some sort of AI assistant ordering of papers, which is specific to a user. So, if I'm interested let's say, in quantum physics and not interested in the first principle, uh, you know, density functional theory, so then I won't see the latter papers I will see them in the bottom and I will see what interests me on top. So I would say that attention should be specific to the user. And uh, um, and that clearly is something that needs to be automated. And it's not that difficult, actually. So in some sense, every time you go to Netflix or something, so you know it presumably shows you movies that you're interested in as opposed to those that you're not interested in. So I think this is an obvious thing that needs to be done. In fact, we are actually working on that. So, so part of the reason Archive has not impl implemented that is there's a computational cost to it. We, we actually struggle to get our current simply ordered output out to the users every day. Um, and the other reason is we, per our advisory committee in particular, we worry intensely about siloing, that, that we narrow people down too much and, and they they become disconnected from stuff they should be aware of. And that, that is that is a broader issue in, in recommendation systems. It's not just specific science. And we would are very interested in solutions to that. Yeah, so, but on your question, John, also, I think you asked, what are the predictions of impact? So first you have to define what impact actually means. Mm -hmm. What is an impact? So, I mean, I guess person not getting a Nobel prize is impact, you know, cure for cancer is impact, but I mean, that I don't think is quite possible to predict on the first day when the paper appears. But if you define impact as, how it affects uh, scientific community. So I think, Stein, please correct me if I'm wrong, but according to Paul Ginsberg, actually initial download rate of papers correlates with their long, long time uh, impact as defined by citations and or long-term downloads. Is this correct? With, with the exceptions of some extremely famous outliers uh, that are well known, uh, uh, Weinberg's, um, uh, initial paper had very little uh, reaction for a couple of years. There, there are a number of, of things that that are sleepers and then suddenly take off. Uh, so, so it 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 it's again field specific and also level of impact. Uh, yeah. Papers that are steady, sustained citations over multiple years in aggregate can be more impactful than things that have very high spikes of. Uh, 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 citation and then taper off because they get obs obs obsoleted. So uh, we have a follow-up audience question, which is related to this point. Uh, so one of the things that can uh, help with preventing siloing sometimes is if simply people in community talking about various topics. And so we have an audience member who's wondering about this idea of having uh, what they're calling a you know a micro forum, but you know basically a way for people to. Uh, have discussions around particular preprints. 
Uh, is this something that uh, either is part of Archive Labs or, or Science Cast uh, is something that people can interact with right now today? Uh, and and uh, if so, uh, maybe we could uh, help direct people to where they can find such things. Uh, yeah, so we have this capability. Um, I mean, to be honest, um, it's not very widely used at the moment. I mean, people do interact with authors, and that's actually not only community, you know, just readers among themselves, but most most importantly with authors, uh, direct access to the authors. But I think there is also a problem with inertia. Like if people spend that in 90% of their time on Twitter or Facebook or wherever, so they just keep doing that. And unfortunately, at least in my opinion, I mean, I just don't understand Twitter. I think it's, in my opinion, it's it's just spoiled with a lot of low quality information. It's not necessarily the best forum to discuss serious research. So we, I think, badly need, I agree with whoever asked this question, that we absolutely need a forum which is free of white noise uh, where we can uh, discuss um, uh, the research. Actually, mathematicians do have such a forum. It's called Math Overflow, which I've used, and I think it's excellent. But in their case, and you can you can see people like Terence Tao and other fields medalists chiming in on you know questions. You know, so this is I think a model uh, to be replicated in other uh, in other in other fields. Which um, yeah, we're trying to build and connect it to archive. And uh, Stein, I don't want to um, you know I think you should comment on uh, archive labs and how you see integration. Yes, so so part of part of archives' motive for setting up the labs framework was to have spaces where you could be tied into archive and provide services that either we uh, can't provide with an archive because of lack of resources. Uh, we, we have a small number of people and a small amount of money, so we, we focus on our core competence and, and keeping everything alive. <laughs> um, but also, um, there are some things that are better done outside the core. Uh, in particular, discussion forums are notoriously difficult to manage. Uh, first, you have to get them to the critical mass, which is an interesting problem, and, and anyone who solves that will become very rich. Um, and the other one is uh, how to stop them from degenerating into a toxic swamp. And uh, to be honest, we, we just don't have the capacity to police that or, or take the responsibility for it. So so we we can't. Yeah, I mean, we've had a, we've we've had some similar experience. I mean, I think my my feeling is that you know, I mean, as 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 as, as was said before, it's a kind of like billion dollar question about how to how to make this happen in one place. Our feeling is that we couldn't do this, so we have a like a combination of you know recognizing that the discussions will happen in different places, but being able to point readers to where those discussions are. I mean, I think you know, I mean, the, uh, what Vector says about math is is definitely the case. Twitter has been a strange place for genomics and actually very early on in genomics, there was a lot of people on Twitter. So you actually did, I mean, things have degenerated in the past few years, but early on there was a lot of conversations in genomics where you people saw that, you know, very well respected people in the field were on Twitter and having serious discussions, but that has not been replicated in immunology. And, you know, and, you know, the minute you, you know, the minute you start discussing vaccines, then that, that kind of deterioration happens almost immediately, for example. So we, one of the things we do in our dashboard is we, we have, a, we do have a comment section on, on bioarchive and on site when it's, there are some discussions there, it's not heavily used, maybe about 5% of papers, but you can go to conversations on Twitter. We wanna be able to go and link out to the conversations on Blue Sky, on Mastodon. And we have some of these, there are a small number of self-organizing com communities. A couple of things sprung up in, during COVID, like um, one was Rapid Response COVID-19, which is an initiative from MIT. There was an initiative from Mount Sinai here in New York and Oxford, where they, they really, they were like, there's these COVID papers coming out. There needs to be some expert interpretation for all these lay readers that we've all observed are, are coming in. So there are a small number of, number of these forums, but a, a, a real challenge is, you know, I always say the most precious um, commodity for an academic is time. And so, you know, it's what is what what is in it for them. And so people will engage if they can really benefit. Um, but trying thinking that we can sort of recreate the peer review process that may be tricky because, you know, there's time is of the essence for all these individuals. Victor, go ahead. Yeah, so I just wanted to provide an example, John, of um, um, a recent paper which was peer reviewed 
uh, quote unquote, um, in the social media space. And actually it was launched on ScienceCast. So I'm moderator, archive moderator in superconductivity. And I, be, I believe it was in July, 2023, you know, Stein texted me saying, oh, there is this paper LK99, which claims to have discovered room temperature superconductivity. And the authors mentioned the video, which was not actually in the original submission, um, and I contacted the authors um, and um, asked them for the video and I put it on the website and linked it to archive. And then in the middle of, uh, so and I forgot about it sort of, and then in the middle of the night, so I woke up because I got a notification on my phone saying that I owe, I put it on my server, I owe, you know, thousand dollars because there were a million people who looked at it. So, and uh, as you may have heard, so this LK99 became a sensation. So we had a lot of traffic on the site. And then it kind of migrated to Twitter and where uh, there were a mixture of high quality, quote unquote, reviews and lower quality comments. But all in all, I think very quickly people, uh, you know, concluded that this was not actually a true result be well before it went through peer review. So I think for such potentially high impact uh, papers, whether it's COVID or high temp room temperature superconductivity or something like that, so we definitely need kind of fast response peer review system, which journals just don't provide. And um, yeah, I guess we're trying to build that within archive labs. Yeah. One of the tools that we have an audience comment that they're particularly excited about is uh, one of the things that you showed of making the content uh, on a slider where you can say for experts or less for experts in terms of what the summary looks like. And uh, Richard also just brought up the point of, you know, suddenly, uh, a few years ago, many more people who are not experts in immunology had an interest in immunology, right? And so uh, I, I wonder if uh, we'll, maybe we'll start with Richard uh, and then uh, the table can comment on uh, what, what you see uh, the, the relationship between these AI tools and that very important topic of, of taking something which, you know, perhaps there's a, a topologist who's interested in large language models or the reverse is true. How, how can we use AI tools to make these things accessible to people who are not currently an expert in whatever field it happens to be. Yeah. Well, when, I mean, I guess the, you know, the obvious thing and a point that Victor frequently makes that, you know, I think having seen some of our articles on BioArchive is that the um, a propensity to use jargon and to use um, acronyms and abbreviations that make something impenetrable it's, it, it's, 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 so, it's so common in biology because it's a shorthand. We know why people do it. So one of the things that, you know, it, it was noticeable when we started looking at some of the lay generated summaries um, from science cast, how they were so much more readable in the abstracts. And in, in part was because it wasn't stuffed with, you know, acronyms like PDK1 that you wouldn't know anything about. Um, I mean, I guess the, I mean, the, the, the one thing that I would say is, you know, I always am very keen to point out on, on, on in bioarchive in particular, the vast majority of these papers are incredibly arcane of interest to a small number of, uh, of experts. So we shouldn't be under the illusion that we can somehow give somebody a kind of like a, a you know, a rapid um, BSc and four year PhD to allow them to, to understand a paper. But I think on, on, the, on the med archive front, that will, that will be interesting. But I, I think that goes to this broader question of providing context and, and, and how we do it. And I think there's a lot that, that, that AI contribute potentially there beyond just summarization. Uh, Stein uh, and Victor, do you have any uh, additional comments you want to make on that that topic of making things uh, more accessible? Yeah. So, so <clears throat> in, in addition to kind of uh, providing information about things to the general public, uh, one of the things that ARCA we're acutely aware of and are hoping that uh, these tools will expedite is, for example, there are known unknowns for people. And, and my canonical example is um, statistics does a lot of research on obscure statistical techniques. And then they write out R code, dump it into the R library, it's validated and, and it floats there. I, I know, and, and I can't think of a specific example, but I, I know of examples where somebody has a data set that is really, you, you, it, they need to know the statistical technique we can help you find it. it, it it'll it'll enable you to get a actual robust uh, result <clears throat> or or solve a problem that is intractable for you. And, and I'm actually acutely, acutely aware of it because when I was 
a young postdoc, I really needed to do a statistical test on some multidimensional data. And um, we had to figure out the hack up one by ourselves because I couldn't find one in the literature that did it. It turns out years later I found it and we sort of did the right thing. But uh, but even more intriguingly, intriguingly, and that's where I think uh, like some of the stuff Victor's working on are the unknown unknowns. The, the research direction we're blind to, the, the gaping hole in our, in our understanding, we're, we're just nobody's looking in that direction. And, and sort of my dream is that we will, we will take the set of knowledge we have and where it's moving and see where we should change direction or where we should stop looking because we had to hit a wall and, and really find ways to expedite discovery even faster and, and better by, by, by finding the stuff we really hadn't thought to think of. But that's getting science fictional, but it's fun. That's a great point that you make, Stein, about how the um, uh, the accessibility question is not just for lay people; it's also for experts across domains. It's a it's a really subtle and interesting point to to bring up there. And Richard, uh, please. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that's an amazing the idea that people will make um, connections across di disciplines and sub disciplines that they wouldn't make because you've got this deli I mean, if you're trying to, you know, if you're working on quantum physics or you're working on pancreatic cancer, you can't read everything in your own space, let alone things that could be relevant from elsewhere. Um, and I'm, I'm always always struck by um, uh, several years ago, I remember going to a um, a data and medicine conference where there was um, a radiologist talking about identifying melanoma. And if, if, if you've ever looked at like melanoma versus benign blemishes on skin, if you're not a radiologist, it is almost impossible to tell. There are things that look horrific that are benign and there are things that look sort of pretty benign and are melanoma. And you have to have a lot of training to do this. And they had trained um, uh uh, an AI to do melanoma detection and got to the point where this was pretty much almost as good as a trained radiologist. But what was very interesting was at one point, um, uh, the radiologist who developed the tool recounted the story of having a patient who he'd seen and he said, don't worry, there's nothing to worry about this blemish that you have. And then he was like, it kind of looks a bit weird. I haven't seen something like that before. I'm just going to run it through the eye, just AI, see, just to see what it what it says. And he ran it through the AI, and the AI came back and said, it's melanoma. So they biopsied it, and it was melanoma. So the AI was seeing some dimensionality to this that mm -hmm. the expert radiologist, despite years of draining, couldn't see so the idea that you know you can imagine at scale the kind of things stein's talking about with connections being made and avenues that, that, that the human being through lack of time or simply not being able to make those connections seems i mean maybe it's science fiction but it feels like that's that should be something that we ought to be able to at least try and pursue i think there's also another dimension that i have some hope over the next years that I, I will hope a lot. So there are a lot of things that uh, interest people, but they just don't have time to follow up on it yeah, because they have a daytime job in a, in a totally different area. Like myself, uh, interest, say, in quantum friction, quantum embezzlement, or some other a little bit exotic things. And uh, if I have time, I read one or another preprint from this. But wouldn't it not be great, Kanda, if really uh, I could, say, take the last two years of archive papers on this subject, put them all coherently together and make me in the spirit of what Victor showed at the beginning, some kind of PowerPoint slide, what has been found out over the last two years. I think that would really speed up uh, potential cross connection to other sciences and uh, spur some ideas of what you can do in your own field. Yes. And, uh, Victor, it looks like you wanted to make a, a point about this topic as well. Yeah, so I just wanted maybe if you let me share a screen for a second. I want sure. to show how it Please. actually works um, in practice. So um, this is, um, for example, a paper by uh, um, uh, Dennis Wirtz, who is uh, vice provost for research at Johns Hopkins. So here is the paper. And so he, well, he obviously knows what he's talking about. So here um, is um, how it works basically so that we take a paper we actually access by archive every 15 minutes we take all new papers when we process them into summaries at two levels we could do it at 22 levels if need be so but this at this stage it's two levels and um, 
Um, so this is kind of simplistic and this is expert. And I think this has a lot of value uh, to people, especially those who are not familiar with a particular topic. And we would like actually to expand it to other, um, other um, um, archives and repositories. But also uh, I'd like to mention, so on your question, John, about making connections between different um, fields. So I'm, I don't know how to do it, but I'm thinking that potentially these embeddings uh, that we work with could uh, look for hidden uh, links between seemingly unrelated topics. Maybe it's obviously embeddings, you know, they project semantic um, data into just numerical uh, vectors basically, but presumably there are some subspaces there where they can intersect and one can look for uh, maybe something that is invisible to humans, but something that can potentially be of relevance uh, to people from different fields and say, hey, look at this paper, even though it seems sounds irrelevant, may, there is maybe a connection. So to develop something like this could be very powerful. I don't know, Michael, maybe. Uh, just, you... I had a discussion with somebody from the U of I about this topic uh, just last week, <clears throat> just some random idea that we discussed was Maybe the information isn't in a single embedding vector, but maybe the information is in uh, in the sense of topological data analysis between mm -hmm. a bunch of preprints about one field and a bunch of preprints from the other side, and then look how they topologically kind of form some simplex in some Hauer space that has some topological similarities. Yes, and find the holes. Yeah, exactly. Higher dimensional ones. <laughs> yep. Richard, please. Sorry, just very quick. I mean, one way in terms of accessibility, I think a, another point to make here is a much more simple one. I mean, I'm conscious on this call that I think I'm in a minority of people who are speaking English as a first language. Um, I, you know, I have I've lived as a kid. I lived in France when I was a teenager. I lived in South America, but I'm aware of the challenge that I was never able to rise to in the way that three of the people on this call have done. One of the things that often comes up a lot in scientific discussions is the fact that just like the web, everybody's using English, it's the universal language, and this is a challenge for an awful lot of people. And when you try and solve it by saying, oh, we should translate things into French and Spanish, then people say, well, what about Hindi and Mandarin? And then you just keep going until, you know, you're not going to solve that, that problem. But AI really has the possibility of solving that problem, both from the author perspective, authors um, are often at a disadvantage when writing. They know that people speaking of the first language often have an advantage here. And, you know, I know colleagues who, when they have postdocs who've come, uh, who, whose English isn't so good, they use AI to make their, um, th their papers much, much better. So from an authoring and um, a, a, a kind of consumption point of view, that I think there's a huge amount that AI can do right now. And that's, you know, that's probably the lowest of the low hanging fruit. Yeah, we're seeing that too. We're seeing people clean up their particular their introductions uh, and method sections uh, using AI tools to to make the English less stilted and and, and flow better. It, it also leads to hallucinations, such as yep. was shown. Yeah. You, you have to be careful. There's a difference between generative AI, where you're making stuff up, and and AI as a sophisticated clippy uh, uh, cleaning up your grammar and. Uh, and getting your prepositions and whatnot done. Yes, this is a great time to bring up this this uh, topic, which I'm actually a little surprised by the lack of audience questions on, uh, but I, I think is an important topic, which is that you know, we, we've been describing uh, humans using AI in order to help them accomplish things. That's the good outcome that, that uh, people at Archive Labs and ScienceCast are working on. Uh, could, could we maybe help draw a clear line between, and Victor showed very, some very striking examples of where we've, we've seen the bad outcome of AI getting involved in this whole scientific uh, publishing endeavor. So can, can we maybe delineate between what are, what are some of the things that we don't mean when we say AI on sub scientific publishing and have a positive connotation with that versus the things that really we, we do mean that we've been discussing. So uh, Victor, you, you showed some quite striking examples. Maybe we'll start with, with you. So what, what, do we, what do we not mean when we say AI in scientific publishing? Yeah, so I think essentially at the moment, I guess, uh, the um, main problem um, that we are facing uh, with using large language model in particular is hallucinations, right? So and the probability of those is never zero. And I guess if you're talking about quantum field theory and you know your AI hallucinates a little bit, well, it may be embarrassing, but you're not going to kill anybody. 
So if you're talking about a vaccine for, there was a recent paper, I believe, related to that. So, uh, and uh, there are some hallucinations about medical um, matters. Well, that's a different territory, right? And in general, we want to minimize hallucinations. So I don't obviously, I, I'm not an expert on training large language models. It's obviously a question everybody's aware of, but one simple solution we came up with, with Richard um, and uh, um, his co-founder, John, uh, specifically for BioArchive, is that we let authors edit the summaries. So, I mean, actually human input, My I love AI, but I actually kind of like humans too, even more so. Um, and if there is a, you know, if there is some human input, it's good, actually. So I would rather, uh, you know, have uh, um, authors go over this and correct it if there is something wrong. So and I think it's been actually quite a successful experiment. So Richard, please correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe people have been using it, right? So, uh, yeah, absolutely. So yeah, so this is kind of maybe it's a band-aid kind of solution, but you know, um, I think it's a hybrid um, of uh, AI-generated content with some sort of sanity checks from humans actual authors of the paper who own the content, by the way. So uh, that would be uh, successful in this uh, in this direction, at least. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but my personal opinion is that I think it's a, it's it's not a good idea to use, it's again, my personal opinion, large language models and AI to write papers, because even without large language models, we're bombarded with papers. We don't need more, we need less. So, and I think that's where the strength of AI is, it's kind of focusing your attention, not making more stuff up but maybe I'm wrong, so I don't know. Uh, and Michael, you, you uh, said quite a few times, you know, you are a proponent of using language models at the things they're good at, and when it's something that the language model maybe isn't the right tool for the job using other tools. So I wonder if you could quickly comment on that point. Yes. <clears throat> like for some of the projects that we are using uh, large language models in-house, I always say, do not be lazy and uh, say, here, large language models do everything. Uh, carefully really do it only there where you can't do it with programmatic way or large scale can't manually thinking really this simple one and uh, I was wondering like uh, one should maybe even use the large language models if they would be a little bit more up to date now they're at least uh, half a year maybe a year old and even my experience is if I asked for a specific archive preprint uh, it has sometimes heard about the paper title, but typically it cannot tell me what's in section four. It has no idea about it. If it would be really more knowledgeable about the whole archive corpus, which uh, with more than 2 million is really substantial, uh, giving it a paper and say, hey, uh, tell me what, what is really new in this one and uh, tell me all the things that I can already find somewhere else that might be a possibility to reduce uh, the overflow of new material. Uh, Stein, please, yeah, you want to make a comment on this point? Yeah, so a couple of comments. One is, one is, I, I'm really looking forward to a human uh, reinforcement, a human learning by AI reinforcement. Uh, kind of cl close the loop on us, but um, on the more general kind of abuse of of uh, generative AI and language models, um, we, we noticed that uh, the translation capacity is it was very early abused. People would translate a paper into another language and then back translate it. And then resubmit it as a new new paper because uh, the transliteration tended to avoid plagiarism det detectors. But it but it triggered I can't remember the technical phrases, but but basically synonyms for technical phrases became a, a anomaly signature. Tortured phrases is that tortured what? phrases. Thank you. Yes, yeah, so like like artificial intelligence became fake brains or something like that. Um, but then. Um, we there was actually it was a prominent social media there was a paper on archive which um, was a copy of another paper where every word essentially had been transliterated and uh, the author of the paper spotted it because they are in fact the world expert on such techniques in ai and um this uh, unveiled a uh, not just a minor industry doing this which we are uh, fighting but uh, it also fed into citation circle fraud. Um, so, and in fact, fake science identities being set up on and science communities to generate plausible backgrounds and, and stuff. And this is a systemic problem for us, not, not just archive, 
but for everyone in science publishing. And it is it is driven uh, not just by the technology being available, but by uh, the fact that then the whole system provides perverse incentives or rewards. Is. And and that is one of the near-term, possibly catastrophic impacts of AI is, is basically human abuse of, of pretty basic AI technologies to um, invoke Goodhart's law uh, in, in with vengeance. I think it's certainly highlighting a few things that, um, you know, people have kind of known for a while, but been unwilling to deal with, you know, we're seeing mm -hmm. this, this paper mill problem that I referred to where people are generating entirely fake papers because they need them as career currency to get promotion. Um, similarly, citations, there's now this phenomenon, cit citation mills, they're called, where fake papers are created purely for the purposes of boosting other citations. And of course, what this is, telling us is that you know we have our kind of incentive structured wrong and people should not be acting as bean counters in academia when they're deciding who to promote and who to hire so that's probably a good thing it doesn't really solve the problem but it says you've got to really you've got to really think about that i mean similarly with misinformation i mean there was this sort of farcical um example that victor showed um of, of the rat image that you know anybody could spot but you know there's probably a lot a lot of other stuff mm -hmm. out there and, and various people have you know there's there's a lot of there's a lot of things that you know humans are already doing really badly and the question is whether or not ai is going to be just as bad i mean humans are incredibly good at creating misinformation we don't need ai for it so it really just focuses on some of these these issues so maybe that's just one thing ai is doing is saying you know we've got to think hard about these things i like to remind people that uh, people also hallucinate and and AI has just sped the process up in some ways. They learned it from us. Yeah, most certainly. Uh, so uh, another thing that uh, the audience has brought up that I want to make sure that we touch on a little bit before uh, we, we come to the end of the broadcast is that uh, the process of, of uh, scientists thinking about their research is somewhat... Uh, somewhat different from what comes out in just the preprint and then the later publication steps, right? In other words, there, there's a lot of collaboration that happens before even getting to that. Uh, are, are there any uh, things that either ScienceCast, Archive Labs, or just in, in general um, would be interesting to say about uh, how, how could some combination of AI tools and the great dissemination methods that we have in terms of uh, the various archives uh, also maybe show some of the thinking process that goes into even creating the preprint or is that sort of before when the problem sort of gets picked up and and run as far as these these organizations are concerned yeah richard well i mean i get i mean i sort of i'm going to sort of answer a bit of a broader question but I, one of the things i always want to say particularly you know going back to that point about the um the bean counting it's to make clear that you know, what goes on archive and what goes on bio archive is a narrative right it's not the experiment, you know, the 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 the, the astronomy or the um, you know, the the gene sequencing or the data is some somewhere else. And I think maybe you know, thinking about that, the the kind of network that Victor described, the network is not just papers. Each of those nodes is collected to a different type of node, which is loads of data. You know, and in clinical in clinical medicine, it may be connected to a trial plan that is registered two years before. So the possibility of uh, creating a much bigger network that can be explored, which links not just the na narrative but the data, the provenance, um, and and research plans, and the kinds of things that you're thinking about. Uh, I think that could be very productive. Yeah. So maybe I can comment too, John, on your question. If I understood it correctly, you're asking whether um some AI tools could be helpful, not only in disseminating information, but in actual research. Is that... Yeah, that, that's part of, yeah. I think that's implicit in the audience member question, yes. So, I mean, at this stage, I mean, in my field, again, I'm only, I'm an expert, hopefully in quantum physics and condensed matter physics. So I don't see it too much, at least on the theory side and experimental side, too much uh, activity in sort of AI driven research. So nobody types in chat GPT, please tell me what problem to solve next. I mean, I think it would be kind of a dystopian scenario, frankly, I hope it never happens. But um, but there's certainly, um, there are a lot of tools which facilitate things, things that I don't want to do basically, like organizing data, processing data. Well, I've used quite a few times Wolfram's um, uh, plugin chat GPT 
So just to run some simple sentry checks, uh, so on some calculations, so it's extremely valuable. Obviously, I use mathematics all the time. So these types of tools, so they're just an extension of already existing computational tools and other tools, which may be sort of an assistant to uh, a researcher. So I don't know uh, when uh, artificial intelligence will become competitive with the researcher. So, but I think the more abstract the field is, the more chess-like it is, basically mm -hmm. the more uh, formalized it is, the quicker it will, uh, AI will basically beat humans. So uh, fortunately or unfortunately, I think for me it's fortunate. So in our field, it's also partly a social activity. So, and like what's important, what's not important, it's a bit of a community consensus. And also it's driven by, I don't know, commercial interests, et cetera. And I'm, I'm not an expert in biology or medicine, but I assume it's similar. So it's less formalized. So, and it's less of a proof driven, like for instance, in physics, very rarely we have exact proofs of anything actually, like even Feynman path integral, which is a you know key uh, ingredient of quantum mechanics, mathematicians say, well, it's just wrong. It makes no sense. And I use it all the time and I'm just fine. So uh, yeah, so basically my point, I guess is, uh, so I think the fields which are very formalized, pure math, I would be worried about pure math. So, but about less formalized fields, maybe less so in terms of uh, humans losing to AI. Um, yeah. I spent so, a fair amount of, sorry, sorry, go ahead. No, you go ahead. I spent a fair amount of time over the last year, kind of mostly with GD4, uh, testing out of limits, kind of what it can do, what it cannot do. And uh, I give it Victor for the next year, probably we don't have to be worried. It will take over and uh, beat us in some ideas what we should do in quantum mechanics. I think it's far, far, far away from this. But one thing that I noticed, and in general, if you ask it, give me something interesting about this, it it just does the opposite. It falls back to the most simple thing it has somewhere heard, uh, really boring, uh, and probably because it has read it 120,000 times on the internet. But what I found already right now interesting is if you give it a couple of disconnected things, hopefully something that still I'll say always in science, quantum physics plus minus, and say, I have heard about this, 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 and this, there must be some relation about them say, weak measurements uh, and relation to quantum energy teleportation. And uh, I encourage it actually to have hallucinations and come up with something. Sometimes what it comes up with, uh, it, it's pure hallucination. It's still not uninteresting and uh, has some interesting ideas inside. So a long time ago, I, I um, beta tested a new thing called Mathematica. And um, it had errors in it back then. Sorry, but uh, it was it was fun. And and at the time when I wrote a paper, you had to say I, I used this mathematical tool because otherwise people wouldn't know where you got your calculation from. We don't do that anymore. If I if, if I if I'm doing a tensor calculation, of course I'm using Mathematica to do the connections or whatever. Um, it, it's become a productivity tool that is ingrained into into the process. So the summer of 22, a couple of my colleagues waved me over at lunch, uh, Paul Ginsberg and Michael Douglas, and, and they were playing with a hugging face sandbox. And, and I sat next to them and said, okay, ask it uh, what the uh, extension to the standard model is. And I saw the answer and I was like, okay, this is going to be interesting. And then that November of that year, I, I actually alerted the archive staff that we now had a, with a problem and an opportunity because uh, I, I saw what was about to happen. Um, AI is 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 going to be it certainly is is will, and will be a part of our toolbox unless we have a jihad and eradicate it, which I, I doubt. Um, it is going to lever our brains. It, it, I mean, it already is. I can do stuff faster and more productively and and move through things. But I I I think it is going to go beyond doing the routine stuff for us and and do make qualitative difference. I just don't know where. If I if I knew where, I'd be doing it not not speculating about it but but i can see it coming and i'd be very surprised if we hit a wall right now i, I think we have some more breakthroughs coming fast so uh, i see that there's a lot of thanks in the audience for all of your participation in, in this and so uh, as we're coming up at, at near the end of when our uh, scheduled time is uh 
I want to make sure that everyone has a chance to give any uh, additional thoughts. It could be about any any topic related to AI uh, and scientific endeavor that uh, you know you, you feel is important and you, you want people to think about uh, as something that we're bringing up here. So uh, let me just give yeah. a quick shout out that th there are right now um, scientific AI collaborations being set up, and the NSF has a call for scientific AI institutes. Mm -hmm. And so, for example, Polymathic at uh, the Simon Foundation. Uh, these are formal collaborations uh, to work on this, and and they're open open source codes mostly. Actually, any of the government funded ones are open source, and they are actually there's an index of them somewhere on the web, which I don't have the link to at hand. So, so things are happening. Um, I'll step back. Mm -hmm. So uh, we don't have a, a hard stop coming up here, uh, but I just want to make sure that since we're nearing the end of when people's schedules might be pulling them to, to other things, that we, we get a chance to sort of go around the table again and, and uh, mention any such important thing. So uh, let's maybe start with, with Michael. Are there any uh, thoughts that you want to leave the audience with as we're getting ready to wind things down here? I think there are exciting times ahead and uh, many things will change over the next two years that we five years ago thought would never change in our lifetimes. And uh, some of the things will be amazing, but some of them will probably also a little bit scary and frustrating. And uh, so, uh, Stein, you mentioned that there are uh, already scientific excuse me, scientific collaborations and calls for uh, proposals out there in, in this space. So uh, aside from this, what are the sorts of things you want to leave the, the audience thinking about? Um, just to remind people that there's also a um, well-funded organized initiatives who are uh, setting up AIs and posting the question, uh, how do I best kill my enemies? It's a two-edged sword. But it's a sobering, sobering point to make for sure. Uh, so, uh, Richard, I, there's, I'm sure, a lot to be said here in terms of application to medical sciences and to, to biology. So, what, what are some imparting thoughts that you'd like to leave the audience with as we get ready to wrap things up here? I mean, I think I would just underscore again this this combination of the human and the AI. I think that that that, that that's critical. That you know, this this. You know the, the the caution every step of the way not to just because of the late hallucinations because it may be something you don't know about you can't trust it you know you need you need some human verification i'm what you know going back to that talk by the radiologist i mentioned he he said oh you know ai will not replace radiologists but radiologists who use ai will replace radiologists who don't so i think every every scientist should be thinking like that Collaboration between uh, human and tool, as we've we've done for a very long time, it's just a different set of tools we're getting used to now. Uh, and Victor, what what uh, thoughts would you like to leave the audience with as we get ready to wrap things up? Yeah. So first of all, thank you so much for organizing it, John. Yeah. Thanks to the audience for uh, their time. And I'll just say that uh, uh, Stein, Richard, uh, and Science Guest were working on developing uh, these tools, but uh, if um, People have ideas about what they want to see. They should feel free to reach out, and uh, we'll be happy to discuss and perhaps implement these tools with Archive and BioArchive and other repositories. So, and just thank you very much for this event. It's a very, very positive note of, of asking people to to contribute to you know building the future in this area because it really is fast moving and, and exciting and. Uh, both from, from the bottom of my heart, thank you all for the work that you do in keeping these uh, archives up and running, uh, because uh, I know personally I've gotten a lot of uh, good use out of them, and uh, uh, and Michael can can add his own, but I know he agrees with me completely on this point. Uh, uh, I think both of our favorite websites, so uh, I expect that many people in the audience are in, in similar boats, so uh, thank you all so much for, for really deeply thinking about uh, how an already good thing can be made both better and what we want to avoid in terms of making it worse uh, in the future as our, our tools evolve. So thank you all so much for joining us. And if you're in the audience, feel free to leave more comments as we see the video after the fact. And also reach out to ScienceCast and uh, collaborate with Archive Labs. So thanks all very much.